We want to make sure we're heard. We want to make sure we're understood. We want to make sure you guys get all your questions answered. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off with the uh, standard, I'll do the Q's and they'll do the A's. And then um, half hour later, you'll do the Q's and we'll do the A's. Does that work out for you guys? Cool, cool. All right. So I'll do my intro last, but let's go starting with Gail, who she is and what you do. Hi, I'm Gail Z. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, and steampunk, uh, mostly for Solaris books and Orbit books. Also do five series of indie short stories and novellas that tie into all of our different book series. On the other side of my life, I run a marketing company and have written six books going on seven for on social media. And uh, my book, 30 Days to Social Media Success, just got named by Lifehack to be one of the top 20 business books to read in 2016. Oh, that's awesome. Ooh. Hi, I'm a writer out of Toronto, Canada. I write steampunk and modern vampires. I also run a small uh, Facebook page with writers where I direct them to listings to find where they can sell their work. I'm Alex Hoflick. I'm an editor at Pseudopod. I, I am a niche market. Uh, I'm part of Escape Artists Incorporated uh, weekly, uh, weekly speculative fiction podcasts covering uh, covering horror, science fiction, uh, fantasy, and young adult. Hi, I'm Tara Burton. I'm a professor of marketing at Kennesaw State University. I also write nonfiction on social media as well. I write Socially Engaged, the author's guide to social media. So that's my niche market. Hi. Hi, I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'm a game developer, which is why I'm way back here in the ghetto, the game dev ghetto. I was the original developer of a game called Vampire the Masquerade a long time ago. We do a lot of uh, my company, HDI. We were very early into ebook publishing for our game books and the Fading Suns line back in the early aughts. And uh, yeah, who's heard that term in forever? And uh, we still publish heavily uh, ebooks, PDFs, etc., for our Fading Suns line and others. And I'll be talking if it's more generally about the gaming side of this as a big niche market. Oh, and I also run the Siege Convention, so if you're interested in game development, come talk to me after this. Hi, I'm Holly Bryant Simpson. I'm a publicist for Entangled Publishing, which is all romance. I focus on scandalous and select historical imprints, which are all historical romance. So I can talk to you about romance and the broken down categories there that are niche. I also uh, previously was with Listen Up Audiobooks, so I can talk about audiobooks as a niche market. Hi, I'm Elaine Calloway. I tend to blend genres and have found a niche market that way because readers are responding to my latest series. I write about southern ghosts. There's a little bit of mystery, a little bit of romance, a little bit of southern humor, a little bit of every a little bit of everything. And I also write um, kind of uh, urban fantasy, good versus evil, and typically blend things together that don't typically go in one book, as a few people in the New York publishing told me. But they are doing very well. So here to talk. Great to be here. And lastly, my name is Sasha Levich, and I am actually also a niche market in myself in that, like Holly, I write romance. Only most of my peers are like most of the panelists up here. I've been published for 17 years. I have 58 titles out in a variety of genres, all in romance, and that's who I am and what I do. I also edit freelance and have edited for a few other houses as well over the course of the uh, last 10 years. And my specialty is, well, understanding markets in general. Now, let's get started with these folks here. First of all, what exactly is a niche market? A niche market? Oh, I know, I know, I feel bad. Uh, niche markets, we talk a lot about market segmentation. So it's when you take a big market and you break it into smaller ones. Well, those really small categories are what we would refer to as niche markets. So it really helps you to know that target market, that niche market. And if you're doing any type of paid social, paid ads at all, being able to niche market can make you very successful. So it's being able to define very clearly who your market is. So examples? We always like to say in the gaming side that we were a niche market because we were never competing against other gaming companies. We're always competing against movies for your time. We want your time. Get off of the TV set and go play a game. 
I like this guy a lot. You know, one of the, one of the <laughs> easiest ways to explain niche marketing is when you go on Amazon, you have your big categories like yes. fantasy, and then there's epic fantasy as opposed to say urban fantasy, and then there's shifter epic fantasy and then there's shifter epic fantasy in Atlanta and then there's shifter epic fantasy in Atlanta every other Wednesday I mean I'm, I, I'm downtown. The, she's yeah, not down kidding, by the way no. yeah when you get into those subcategories those are niche markets and as an author it's a lot easier to find that audience that really wants what you're delivering if you set out to own those niche markets and work your way up to the bigger categories. It's harder to be number one in Kindle on fantasy or epic fantasy, but it can be easier to be, say, number one on Kindle in comedic horror. Uh, that's a, you're, you're up against less competition but you've also got die hard fans of that niche who are looking for content so it's a big fish in a small pond is what you're saying yeah yeah yes. and uh, something I'd like to say uh, it, th about c who your competition is there's you know as primarily a audio market you know we're competing with people who aren't reading not not with the other uh, not with the other uh, audio fiction out there <coughs> Now is that the ACX? Uh, no, we're. I, I, I'm not sure who our distributor is. Okay. I, I, Audible doesn't Lipson. do podcasts; they just do audio books okay. and audio drama. But anything that takes a person's time mm -hmm. that they're using for entertainment is actually your competition. Yeah, so yeah. leisure activities. Yeah, leisure activities. You know, I'm going to come at this from a different aspect and say that it's not for me an issue of competition; it's an issue of discoverability, mm -hmm. because uh, it, it's it's not that if you, you know, my my readers read 200 books a year, so they can read all of my books, all of my new books, read all of my back stock twice, and still have you know quite a bit of room to read other authors. It's not a zero sum game. The difficulty is having new readers find you and that's where owning some of these niches really comes in handy because people who are looking for something really specific are going to be very excited to find you and tell their friends and you can then expand that from niche to niche but it, it's a discoverability thing. It's easier than ever to get published. It's harder than ever to stay visible because there's so much signaled noise. So it sounds like you're talking more about being creative and non-competitive as a mindset versus I just want my readers to find me. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, definitely a good point to take away is you don't, I mean, yeah, these authors, a couple of them up here actually are my competition. But we don't write the same way. Our voices are all different. And the stories, even if you gave Elaine and Holly and I the same plot, it's going to be a different story coming from all three of us. So let's take a minute. And number one, I want to define SEO and ask if it's relevant to you guys. Well, SEO is search engine optimization. And you know that's, that can be a lot like chasing unicorns. Uh, it's fabled and everybody has an opinion about it but um, it, it can be very difficult to, to nail down. Uh, bottom line is you want to come up on the first page of search engine results when somebody puts in uh, what you want to be best known for. Uh, obviously you should come up on the f you should come up at the top for your own name. Uh, it would be nice to come up at the top for your book title uh, unless it's been overused but then you can go from there onto your niche and if people are are looking for shifter fiction in Atlanta you really want to come up on the first page of those search results if that's what you write I fully agree that uh, SEO is like chasing the unicorn because if it catches you your ass is gonna hurt and uh, in uh, by that I mean you want to make sure you're controlling what comes up first and for us back in the vampire days that could get kind of nasty uh, thankfully for what we're doing now in the Fading Sun stuff, we can make sure that it's our website that comes up first, sites that are selling us coming up after that, uh, reviews after that. And I, I think that it's always good to have negative as well as positive reviews. That way people don't think you're completely flooding the water with fake reviews. So it's always good to have this sort of commentary come up. But to be ahead of the game can be critical. And uh, it 
part of this for us is having fans who will go ahead and start linking this stuff. So when there are nice positive YouTube reviews about what we do and what our books are and so forth, making sure that folks are linking that uh, up and around, make sure those will show up higher in search results than, than the reviews that maybe aren't as happy. Now, are we focusing from this on, on a point of view of writing or creating our product to fit the market, or are we doing what we want to do and making sure we can find it? More the latter. It? More the latter, I would have to say. I mean, we, we've always had the conceit that we design the games we want to play, and thankfully other people want to play them too, and we write the books that we want to read, and thankfully other people want to read them too. Uh, and I'll admit that's a bit of a conceit, because there is always the idea of who is our audience in the back of our heads. But in the end, making sure they can find it and find it presented in an appropriate way, a way that is honest to what we've done is, uh, is important to us. It's also about knowing, like she was saying, like Tyra was saying earlier, knowing your audience. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, readers are big on series, so if they can find you by using SEO and you can rise to some of those smaller niche categories, you know, like demons and devils in Atlanta <laughs> kind of thing. On which, Tuesday nights. Right, which, which a couple of my elements, <laughs> my urban fantasy series did that one time and you know there's no way well I won't say that but it's doubtful that I would be able to be you know number eight in romance on Amazon but I can be number two in right. romance ghost stories you know whatever which so makes you an Amazon bestseller. Right. right which is also something you can put on your bio and S well once let's you get writing it can let's know. talk about that for a minute because I saw an article, I guess it was a few weeks ago, and I forgot the author's name, un unfortunately, but they talked about being that Amazon bestseller and how easy, how stupid, simple it is easy to get that trait. Now, that being said, do you guys think about that when you write or when you produce content or ship? I don't think about it when I write, but I think about it when I plan a launch for a book because it can be very simple to to hit number one in one of those categories um, by by making sure 20 of your closest friends all agree to be online on launch day and constantly retweet, like, share, comment. That's what I've done. Yeah, I, I mean, you can definitely own categories that way. Is it going to get you number one on Kindle? Is it going to get you in the top? hundred Kindle sellers, maybe, maybe not, but you can definitely own categories that way. Which also works well with when you're doing Facebook ads, we mm -hmm. may be jumping ahead, but one of my, the first Southern Ghost Book story that I did hit do. number one in 2015 in um, Kindle Ghost category. So I put that on my Facebook ad, number one best Amazon mm -hmm. bestseller, Ghost Stories 2015. And that tends to give a little bit of credence to um, anybody that's doubtful about buying it. Two so. of the people that I know that are doing really, really well indie publishing are John Hartness and Rick Altieri. And both of them are publishing in, uh, you know, a, a, a small niche of comedic horror. John writes the Bubba the Vamp, Bubba, Bubba the Monster Hunter series, and it's exactly what it sounds like. like he says Bubba Hotep. He's, he says it's it's like uh, Duck Dynasty meets Dark Shadows. Awesome. <laughs> and Rick writes about Bill the Bill the Vampire, the accountant. He's an accountant vampire, and it goes from there. Okay, if you're looking for funny horror, that's not a huge niche, but they own it, and they're doing they're they're paying their mortgages off of it so go down and do likewise and i'll just note uh, keep in mind that there are other places other than amazon you want to be noticed i don't worry about my amazon rating as much as i worry about where i'm on drive through rpg and the, uh, the equivalents like that so if you're selling into alternate markets look at those channels and uh, going back with the uh, the duck dynasty meets dark shadows i'm giving you guys duck shadows for free go run with it publish it take that niche <laughs> sorry so many things wrong with this panel today <laughs> and we haven't even started to drink yet so no <laughs> we're actually all sadly sober i think uh, at least i am for a change don't tell anybody um real quick because i asked her about it and she's good at this sort of stuff gail and anyone else who has an opinion of course Black Hat SEO, what is it? Why do we need to bother with it, if at all? Well, Black Hat SEO is, is uh, basically cheating, and it can come around to bite you on the ass, and it probably will. This is, it can be everything from hiring uh, friends, hiring companies in Malaysia to run up your uh, reviews at, 
with people who've never read the book. Um, it, it's all the cutting corners, cheating stuff. Don't do that. Come on, create a better product and and work for it uh, because it will find you out. <laughs> <laughs> going against what I was going to say traditionally. Not that I've done this. I have not. But I have known of other authors that, for example, would have friends of theirs create four or five multiple Amazon accounts. It is done on a regular basis. Whether it's the best practice or not, I, I'm still out in the window or on the fence about. But Amazon's getting happen. Amazon's getting smarter about catching that. And as okay. usual, Amazon overreacts. So you have Amazon saying, you know, okay, we don't want authors writing reviews for their own books. I get that. Um, but then they expand it to, well, we don't want anybody who's close to the author on social media writing <laughs> reviews yes. for the author's book. You know, if if your mother buys the book and likes the book, she's entitled to her opinion, whether That's she's your point. mother or yeah. not, or your high school best friend or your sister or, you know, your husband. So uh, that that's kind of overkill. But there's two companies that you really don't want to piss off, and they're Google and Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, how I come at Black Hat SEO is completely different. I look at it just in terms of search op engine optimization. And you'll see people out there that are Black Hatters, and what they're doing is they're trying to figure out what that algorithm is all about, how what puts what up. Um, so don't be that, but go talk to somebody who is, because they may have a good tip for you. But um, well, plus try. the fact that Google changes their, their, their algorithm every six months anyway. And so I, well, does Amazon. I don't think they know what their algorithm is. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just be honest here. But pay attention. When you see that Google's updating its algorithm, read a couple of those articles and try to pull the tidbits mm -hmm. out. When they made geolocation important for search, that changed the ball game for a lot of businesses. Same thing with Amazon. They're using an algorithm to figure out if you're looking at um, Gail's book, Whose book are they going to suggest? You know how they always have that list down there? Look at those. And if it's your book out there, if you've got your book, see who they're suggesting. Find out where their readers are because that means they're categorizing you together. Now, one of the ways that you can legitimately influence that also read is by collaborating with other authors. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you've been by the author booth uh, that I'm in in the vendor room and, and there are about a number of, wow. There are a number of us uh, who are collaborating on this here at the con. Modern Magic is a ebook box set of 12 full length books by 13 dark urban fantasy authors. It's a buck 99 on Kindle until the end of the month. Why did we do that? We did it be and we selected, John Hartness and I ran this, we selected the authors we invited to be in this e-box set to be complementary readerships but not overlapping too much with the idea that if you read the ebook box set, you're, we're all going to pick up new readers from this. And we have seen the also reds rise dramatically among the, the um, 13 authors that are in the set. So you can, you can game this legitimately. Now that's an interesting, interesting statement because we did a box set, um, me and f five other authors, uh, last December as a menage box set that did very, very, very well. And I have seen an increase in royalties. Mm -hmm. Now we did a second box set that was paranormal. That thing tanked. We did a second box set of Minaj stories and it should have done as well based on the first. We're not so sure why it tanked as well. I don't know what that's about. Well, and you have to be careful because there was another box set that came out just before ours um, with uh, 21 authors in it, but they made the mistake. This is where you got to know the rules for Amazon. They made the mistake of putting in their subtitle best selling authors. That's a no no on Amazon. Amazon yanked 1,800 of their pre orders. Wow. So breaking the rules can come back to bite you in the butt. So, how do you guys, I and mean, I always have to ask this question because Obviously, if we're talking about things that a lot of folks don't necessarily think of in publishing as being part of your job, understanding SEO, understanding SEM, understanding how to use social media, or for that matter, to use social media, how do you balance all this we're just talking about up here with learning and still get the novel or ship the product to use the language of um, Seth Godin? How do you ship still while learning this? Set aside time and use an egg timer. Egg timer works well where you limit yourself because Facebook can be a time killer, and I am very guilty. Of it. I am very guilty of it as well. Yes, you 
before. Uh, well, the, <laughs> in in my huh. 30 days to social media success, the whole idea is it's one chapter at a time. You can learn in 30 minutes a day with action items to do at the end of it, and you can execute in, in half an hour a day to get started and ramped up and do it strategically because it, it can be overwhelming. And if you don't watch your time and, and go out there with a plan, it, it's just a time suck in a black hole. It's not only social media either, mm -hmm. it's researching. Because mm -hmm. if you research, oh, yeah. and thank mm -hmm. goodness I don't write historicals, but the, the people like Diana Gabaldon and those that really, really research all of that history and then combine it into a fiction series are brilliant and I don't ever want to research that much. That's why I make up things. <laughs> so I don't have to do all the research, but that can be a time sucker as well because you could just get down and deep, 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 deep down into research and you look up and it's like six hours is gone. I was supposed to be writing today. so. Uh, I'm a publicist, not an author, so I really just focus only on that, but I still try to use my time wisely and for that I use a lot of lists on Facebook and Twitter so that I don't get sucked into the personal aspect of it and just have the professional lists open when I am working. I spend a lot of time with my writers. It's a writer's group online, just very casual, but I find if I find markets, I spend about two or three times a week, about 10, 15 minutes, searching for new markets for all these writers to submit to because I can cherry pick what I know they think they'll like. Um, you also can get onto a lot of mailing lists if you are trying to sell work. And that can also give you an idea of what people are looking for with anthology calls and the like. And that's where I've made like several sales already this year, is by getting into those niche market open calls for work. So you just have to build a stock of material ready for it to go. I literally submitted a uh, sketch and a proposal on a sheet of paper and emailed it to her quickly as she was running out the door to the airport. And I have made two sales so far this spring and they're coming out in October but it's again time management you have to make sure you set aside exactly that time to do that task and then go back to the writing something I strongly recommend to writers who work with me above and beyond time management is realize when you are most effective at different tasks mm -hmm. my most creative writing before I had a daughter was between midnight and 4 a.m. Yeah. that <laughs> don't work no more <laughs> so now the writing has to happen early in the morning and as my effectiveness dwindles then I can go to the Facebook social media tasks and and so forth the things that really are a little less mindless require less creative energy um, and on the other hand if those were tasks I was not I had no comfort level with now, I would do those when I was at my peak effectiveness. So I would break down my day based on when I can get the best work done. And you have to know that that's going to vary for person because I'm really not worth anything creatively in the morning until I'm on about my fourth cup of coffee. <laughs> so from, from eight to noon is my social media, do the email, do the, the rote tasks that don't require a whole lot of right brain. And then after lunch, I kick into gear on the actual creative writing. So whatever works for you. Right. Yeah. And this actually kind of brings me to my next point because she mentioned it when it comes to um, having that creative focus and having that time understanding that. One of the people I'm following on Twitter particularly or Facebook is Tim Ferriss. And he has a, a post out there on the 4-Hour Workweek blog about your 1,000 true fans. Mm -hmm. Talk to me if you were familiar with that about that. As far as that thousand being, it's all you need because they'll do the work for you. As far as marketing is concerned. Well, um, I know that one of the things that that we try to do is we we know who some of our our, our biggest fans are, and we we work real strongly to engage with them. There there's several folks on you know these folks on Twitter have have a significant megaphone, and you know we engage with them and make sure that that they, they boost our signal. And these folks over on, on Facebook um, do the same thing. Uh, also, you know, work, having, having conversations with them. Uh, my my co-editor runs all the, uh, the Facebook engagement. I've got, I, I, I've got Twitter set aside where I use my, I don't, I don't have a personal Twitter, it's just the company and I cosplay as that. So, um, that, that's one of the ways that, that we divide up kind of our social engagement and make sure that, that we 
keep some of those specific folks involved. It's also good. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's also good if you, whether you are just starting out or you've been writing for years, to build a newsletter list. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend calling it a newsletter list. A lot of people are overwhelmed with email and they don't like signing up for a newsletter. <laughs> but I have one trick I use is I say, join my readers list and people are not as hesitant to, um, you know, join up and learn about stuff. And I do coupons and sneak peeks and cover reveals and everything else. But Facebook, Twitter, all of those things are wonderful and I use them faithfully. But in the end, all you really own is your own list. Facebook can change the rules like that, like they did with mm -hmm. fan pages. Mm -hmm. Twitter could go away. I doubt it will, but Twitter could go away tomorrow. You don't, you don't own those. You own those fans that you have on your list and also network in other mediums well and, and for authors you can you can gather that those thousand true fans with patreon and reward them and nurture them with exclusive content or first reveals on content or access to you um, you can also do that with street teams um, and you know I, i've got my shadow alliance street team they're wonderful they help signal boost um, they get extra coffees or dinners with me. They, they have exclusive t-shirts. They get goodies and, and uh, sneak peeks, and I tell them stuff I don't tell anybody else till later. It's ways of nurturing the people who are really into you and keeping them engaged. And I would go beyond even that, and I would incentivize them not just with goodies, but incentivize them to support each other. Mm -hmm. So with yeah. the Vampire Line, we had a fan group called the Camarilla. She did an incredible job of promoting the game and in gaming we need these people we need the gms are actually going to run the games and excited about it to bring in more players they are our evangelists we need them i can't believe that white wolf let that fall by the wayside so it's not just give them goodies it's give them reasons to support each other to continue spreading the word beyond uh what they could do individually and i think it's actually really important Not just content for like here's a sneak peek. She, um, I mentioned Tim Ferriss earlier. He does a thing called Five Bullet Friday, and it's just five. It's a real quick email with five random things he's into. And I thought that what if my Patreon supporters got to see a little more of me? So yeah, they're supporting me as an author, but they're actually getting to know who I am as a person as well. Um, it's dead. Yeah. Um, I want to do, if you wouldn't mind, if you guys would be gracious enough to allow me to do this, I want to do Q&A from you fine folks. Now, how's that sound? Yay. Awesome. Yay! 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 Somebody give me a hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, Elaine, you know the drill since we don't have the box around, so hands up and... Uh, um. Oh, the box. Oh, we have right the box. Oh, we have the box. Okay. No, you take that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Now we can. Uh, it's not like a past few years. Feedback. Guy in the gray shirt. Here. Gray shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so some of you have seen Hello before. Again. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, you look familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a very specific question, but it's a niche panel, so sue me. Um, <laughs> please don't sue me. Done. Um, <laughs> so uh, I write uh, nonlinear uh, choose-your-own-path stories, and um, so far I've only self-published on my website um, downloads. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you know of any outlets, publishing outlets, um, other forms, like other media, uh, that would facilitate sort of the interactive nature of my stories, and this is just ignorance on my part, can, can Kindle support like hyperlinks so you can jump around from within? Yeah. 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 It can. Uh, the way the chapters are broken down anyway, if you click on a chapter, it'll take you to it, so it'd be set up in a similar way. Okay. And, uh, and seriously, uh, choose your own adventures. You're, you'll have no problem on drive through RPG and the like. Get those up there. Well, well, uh, yeah, and that's a good yeah. idea to look at the yeah, gaming industry for that because okay. there's a lot of gamers that would like that because it's very kind of that RPG driven. So that's mm -hmm. a whole market you may not have thought of. Hi. Hi. So back when I was younger, I was a big I was big on doing art. I had a lot of followers and all that, and then I decided to deactivate my account because I was young and stupid. Now, doing art isn't the big thing. How do you 
publish? How do you do that? Because I don't hear about, I hear about Reddit, but the most things I hear about Reddit are things I hear about on the news. And I'd rather not be involved in that. But, <laughs> so. Well, well, Reddit works on a neat reason because the subreddits are broken down so specifically that you can find your six people who love exactly what you've done and have six friends who have six friends all in that subreddit. So it's neat for that. So if you're looking for a niche, mar niche market, Reddit is a good place to go find it. There's a subreddit for literally everything. So you can probably find your people there. And you can um, unfollow the politics. And you can, <laughs> yeah, and you can unfollow all the defaults. Don't, just don't follow any of those. Um, but I'll let someone else take the rest of your question. So what category are you in, may I ask? sci-fi fantasy but mostly like the conflict between the two okay so there's probably groups out there that are talking about them uh depending upon the age range that you're looking at i think you've had really great experience with tumblr yeah. looking there for not only writers but readers but connect with other writers that are doing that that's one thing we haven't talked about but networking with others within your creative community can really help you find outlets so i might start there where you could find some writers that are doing the same sort of thing that you are doing and then they'll help you find your way as well. And don't be afraid to understand that, that, that you ask us for help because we're number one more than grateful to do so because chances are somebody gave us a hand up or beyond. But you understand that a lot of us, the, the more our career progresses, the less time we have to spend. So make sure you ask the question you need to have answered, not kind of uh, 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 pussyfoot around it. So uh, our Fading Suns game, we classify as science fantasy. I mean, basically it's magic in space and they don't understand the technology and all that sort of thing. And uh, the fiction has done very well appealing to that market, kind of explaining this uh, both friction and cooperation between the two genres. It works very well for us. And I think there is a significant fan base for that, for, for science fantasy done well. And there are existing books in it. I don't generally see it as a niche category. I don't see it defined that way, but I think it could do very well. And I think just finding the other sources that have done, the other um, publishers who have already done that, and seeing who's reading them is a great way to get started in promoting your own tools. And to uh, touch back on something uh, Nico mentioned, you know, knowing when um, you know, ca special calls are available, uh, the submissions grinder is an amazing uh, free resource uh, that has nothing but markets listing when they're open when there are special calls and you know pay rates and all, all the things associated with that I, I can't recommend them highly enough it's basically duotrope except that you don't have to pay for it and oh, and nice. uh, the the submissions grinder um, it's, uh, diabolical plots is the the, the guy who runs it um, just don't go looking for grinder while you're looking for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or do, I mean, do you know what I think. I find a lot of my uh, markets to send to my author friends and colleagues doing that networking thing through uh, darkmarkets.com. And you, they send out a mailing, a mail out every two to three weeks. So you're not inundated with mail, but it's all just the new markets. And I don't have to remember to go look at their page. They just send it to me. And I can go through and I can click. And that's where I found... Um, a really niche market for uh, they wanted West Coast vampire erotica and I'm like I lived in Vancouver for 14 years I write vampire stuff how could I not do this yeah. so <laughs> and that one comes out in October so awesome. dark markets and I will just add one more thing before we get to the next question um, I wouldn't say deviant art is dead but it, there's always new technologies coming out, but I found my graphic designer through DeviantArt, mm -hmm. and she is absolutely fabulous. So I'm very, very glad that I found her there. Well, <laughs> so. It's kind of shifted. The literature part of it is mostly just people like, oh, yeah, Stephen King wrote this book, and then they're like, oh, it's more turning towards bloggers than it is, and fan fiction than it is towards stories. The design it's, and all. It's okay. always been a, a fan fiction-based thing, if I've understood correctly about well, it. There was kind of a, like, there was kind of a small occult area where it was new content, it, content where it was original dark poems and original stories and kind of like, you know, scarier stuff, stuff, stuff. And okay. I had a, about 2,000 followers. Oh, 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I did find my cover artist and the stock photography on DeviantArt, so it's still there. I just don't go there very often. Okay. Sir? This is an Amazon specific question. Uh, whenever you are on there, that's why the boss. <laughs> and you are, you know, there's the drop downs and you're selecting the genres and you can do, I don't know, three or four different ones, mm -hmm. but, but the categories that you're able to select from are still fairly generic and fairly wide. So if you had West Coast Vampire Erotica, how on Amazon can you really classify yourself in a really specific niche? Keywords. keywords yeah. And keywords are not, and it, I took a class on Amazon keywords and it makes sense, but no one ever really knows this. Amazon keywords are not necessarily just one word. No. Yeah. It's yeah. a phrase. It's like yeah. a Google search engine. We call them slugs. Okay. Well, yeah. like Google search so. engines. So things like um, things like Paranormal. West Coast Vampire Erotica. Right. Yeah. Ghost stories set in New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. You know, fallen angels that live in Manhattan. <laughs> that kind of thing. That will, if you put those in the good keywords that you know people are kind of searching for on Amazon, you can get up in those ranks and some of them Amazon will just assign you a category I and Amazon is not Amazon SEO is actually different than um, Google SEO number one yes. and number two when you have your keywords in your it's because it's gonna be in your copy I've had to change how I wrote copy for authors because initially I wrote copy the same way that I presume Gail and probably Elaine and a few other folks have written it before in terms of the sales pitch to get you to you know engage in your attention but my last publisher had said no we have to change the way you do copy I said what do you mean she goes we need to keyword this mm -hmm. and there's, there, there are rules about keyword loading in that that we can cover if you guys want just someone with that. Mm -hmm. okay. oh am I going yes sir all right well my question sort of a different category I, I'm more interested in the definition of a certain niche a definition I guess um, I've been trying to branch out. All my writing was in one category, and I've been suggested by some people that trying some other stuff would be, you know, conducive to better writing. But one of the things that was suggested was YA, and I realized that I don't have a good understanding of exactly what that means. Is it just simply the only definition is writing geared to young adults, or is there more to that genre than simply it's marketed to young adults? YA can cover, it. there's also new adult now, so you kind of, it used to be YA was a fairly broad teenage kind of range, and now there's new adult, which is kind of 18 to 20 into their um, early 20s, so that's the, it kind of broke away, but within YA there's um, urban fantasy, there's fantasy, there's science fiction, there's YA contemporary, YA romance. So if you think about all the genres that are already out there, you can tack YA onto the front of them, and it probably exists. And if it doesn't, there's rule what? Rule 34? It's not what I'm going to be using for YA, hopefully. No. Not quite that way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a little bit more of a personal type question, but when you're starting to market to these niche markets and you're doing something, how did you deal with somebody like, say, from that only knows you from another job or something or your family? who suddenly finds out you're writing this really specialized niche fiction. I'll start this one because I'm the odd man out. So what most of you don't know is I'm an avid cigar smoker and an avid alcohol enthusiast. That is not code word for drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, every Sunday night, I generally tend to go to my cigar club in the Virginia Highlands area. And when I'm talking to people, because I'll take my Kindle, when I'm talking to folks, my bartenders already know I'm, I'm out there. I've been going there for about a year now, and they already know that I'm poly and all kinds of other weird things that don't bear mentioning here. But then folks will ask me, in a, in a male-dominated uh, industry, for lack of a better word, what do you do for a living? <laughs> you, hate on, you hate on boxes. <laughs> anyway, and I'll say very proudly, and a lot of it, I think, in my particular case, comes from, understand, uh, from owning my own power. I know who I am. I'm a very proud romance author. I'll go to bat with anybody and talk about the authors that are out there that have inspired me. And most of them are female and older than I am. And good, they're great writers. That's how I just, I just own my own power. 
in my day job, I have to deal with legislators, the governor, and folks like that. So uh, the fact that my business card used to read Vampire Developer and a lot of my stuff is right and stuff like that actually means that there's not much I can do to shock them. They're, it's all out there already, and uh, I can, to a degree, uh, be myself. So, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those who says proudly own it unless the day job is, uh, I don't know, Jerry Falwell, and the night job is uh, writing the stuff we like. Yeah, I mean, my family knew that I was going to be writing this stuff from the get-go. My kids consider Trish Drake, the main character in my Chronicles of the Necromancer series, to be their invisible older brother because he's been around longer than they have. My husband knew he was part of the package when he married me. Uh, so, and, and my coworkers all knew that I was only doing this corporate thing until I could get published. Uh, so, yeah, you gotta own it. Uh, it was no surprise to anybody. I have some family back home who are extremely conservative, shockingly so. They don't know what I do, and thankfully my mom does, but she doesn't tell them or she avoids mentioning it, so I just, if I go back home for visits, I don't say anything. But everybody else in the real world knows what I do. I just keep it separate from them because that will get weird. I keep it separate using a pseudonym. And I'm not a teacher or a priest, <laughs> so there really was no <laughs> necessary need. I just, I liked that separation. Um, but it, actually the very first time my mom read one of my books and she got to the sex scene, she was kind of horrified. Um, but at, now she's used to it and it's like, okay, yeah, I could do this. But it, it was a little weird, but you know, close friends and family know what I do, so. With the box. I, I have a contribution, if that's okay. I work a little bit with Alex. And you were talking about uh, Black Hat search engine optimization, right? Yeah. If it's all right. Word up. Don't try to hoodwink your readers. Like, I assume Black Hat op search op engine optimization means using sketchy tactics to get your results higher. Don't try to hoodwink your tactics uh, readers by using the same title as a popular work. And the thing that comes to mind is Catch-22. If you go on Amazon and you search for Catch-22, you will find the famous one by Joseph Heller that kids have to read for school and whatnot. And you will also find another novel titled Catch-22 written by J. Random Person. And that has like a one-star review because so many people have been hoodwinked into buying that book. You're not going to gain readers by hoodwinking them. I was able to use that actual technique, to be honest about it, when it came out to be a popular book that I will not mention now. But that was just to draw blog traffic. And I, I actually got what I wanted to happen out of it. We got a good discussion going on about books in the, the genre of the same one as this. And mentioned some authors and hopefully we did some sales. Uh, really, really quick question. It was brought up that um, Amazon can uh, and is cracking down on friends and family doing reviews. How stringent are they? I mean, if my mom reads my stuff, she's going to review it. Very. I love her, but <laughs> I'd say it depends. Very. Mm -hmm. There are people that have no contact whatsoever with me, and I've had reviews pulled, and it just they they randomly will take things down. It, were I, they re it, were they confirmed buys that they took down? What do you mean confirmed by? So if somebody buys, yeah, verified, excuse me, thank oh, you. Oh. Verified um, purchase. If they're verified purchase, I, I, they could I that. I think yeah. one or two of them are, and they did write, and I don't know if it was ever published or not, but I occasionally will randomly have reviews removed, and I don't even know the person, but Amazon suspects they're something. I always, you know, do tell friends and family not to mention, oh, I know this author and I'm so proud. Don't mention that in the review. Just review the book. Well, and, and there's been a lot of pushback on that because just because you know an author, if you've read the book, right. you should have the freedom to post a review for that. It actually skews things in favor of the mega bestsellers who are the only ones who have huge audiences of people they don't personally know who are reading their books. The rest of us are at places like this and working our butts off on social media to meet people so that you do try out our books. America. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, I was just curious, um, I, it sounds like you could actually make this, you know, marketing of your, of your work your full-time job and try and <laughs> narrow it down to only 20% of the time so you're doing what you're best at to start with. What things can you do to sort of outsource pieces of this or a big part of that uh, until you get a big publisher that that's their responsibility? Can I mention you made a video? 
can can we forget the idea that when you get a big publisher, it's their work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you made an idea? <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, Tim Ferriss has this whole thing on the four-hour work week called Your Man in India, and literally, I'm not sure about now, but you can actually pay somebody five bucks an hour to do those little tedious things. Three fifty an hour on Elance. When you get um, a publisher, you get a publicist as well, uh, and you can hire a publicist freelance. You don't have to go through a publisher. So there's that's there's true. Publicists there out there that can do all of that for you. There are, but it also helps if you understand what they should be doing so that you can manage them correctly and know whether or not they're really giving you what you need. And that is not to say that you should abandon all of your social media because you are mm -hmm. still the person who is mm -hmm. representing yourself and your book. Yes. So your publicist can help guide you, but you still need to be out there and being the representation. No matter how big the publisher, you need to be out there. Because yes. they want to connect with you. They don't want to connect with Joe that they don't know. And the other thing is, too, um, if you live in a college town uh, and they <laughs> teach social media, uh, like at Kennesaw State, um, I can help find you interns. <laughs> I, I work but it's with a great place to look for young people who are, who are also cheap labor, who need experience to build portfolios, and you can work together uh, to create something you both benefit from. But do so. pay your interns. Yes. yes. And there are authors that also hire virtual assistants. Yeah, I, I work with a couple of virtual assistants, and they help me with posting. So if I'm busy, if I'm traveling, and I need to have a blog post hit at a certain time, they'll they'll put it up for me. Um, they'll schedule on uh, Hootsuite or or Social Oomph to make sure I've got tweets going when I'm on airplanes and I can't can't put them out there. They're not responding to comments on social media. That's all me. But they're helping with the behind the scene things. And at a time when I was doing a lot of press releases and um, posting articles and posting things like that. I was working with um, a virtual assistant firm in India because it was very it was very rote. Not that they weren't great with the English language, but I wasn't having them post anything. They, they were doing the click here, post here stuff, and it was very economical, um, and, and they were great with it. So you still have to manage it. And that's what your man in India actually is. It's your man in the India com, and they are a virtual assistant for literally anything you can think of. Next, I don't know. I don't see. Anyone? Right here. I got a different question. Um, there's been a lot in the media lately about uh, PayPal uh, blocking payments for like adult content. Have any of your of your writings come under the adult content? button and have you had any problems gaining getting your payments for, from PayPal or anything? Now I can actually honestly answer this one as a no I have not and I've been involved in the adult content world and I mean legitimate adult content not yeah, yeah. what we do up here and I've been paid by those companies and I've had no problem but it's going to be a, a uh, your mileage may vary question. I've only had a problem once. I got paid seamlessly for the anthology because they don't mention erotica in the title, but I sell custom-made jewelry and the word Persian referring to a technique in the thing, PayPal jumped on that with a quickness. And it's like I'd sold this piece over and over and over for years and then suddenly randomly they took issue with it. And okay. then my name got flagged once, they told me, because a lot of PayPal scammers were using the name Nico and I'm like, what? Yeah. So yeah. randomly, PayPal will get a bug up its butt and target something. And over there. That, that happened to a friend of mine because she makes Iranian scarves. What's okay. Iranian scarves? Uh, she um, makes Iranian scarves, just the style, but everything got shut down because they suspected terrorism. Oh, God. Shut down Etsy, <laughs> shut down America. America. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Who else? What's up? Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I write uh, young, ad young adult uh, contemporary and super supernatural. Um, and so I'm just starting out. I have a story on um, Amazon. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so I'm trying to figure out like the whole social media thing and I have like my own personal accounts, but uh, you know, I can't quite seem to grasp like 
how I need to, do I need to have a separate one that's an author page, because my friends who are authors have several auth separate author pages and um, you know, separate uh, Twitter accounts, and I, I'm just overwhelmed by it all. And as far don't as the author page goes, yeah, you should have one. Um, Facebook sucks, and <laughs> it's not going to show up like you want it to. But you should have one so people can find you there, and you should participate in Facebook groups. And um, since you write young adult, I would recommend Instagram and Tumblr for finding your audience. Um, but just figure out where your audience is and be there for them on social media. But find one that you enjoy and focus on that. Don't try and spread yourself thin to be on every single platform. And if, if you've got a very common name, having a specific author page really helps to make sure that people find you because then it's your name author and then you come up at the, at the top of that engine. So Sounds what good? are you comfortable using now? Oh, um, I, I have personal accounts on, I have uh, Instagram, I have Tumblr, I have Twitter, I have Facebook, I have... So which one do you like using? Um, I like using Instagram and... Start there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and use hashtags on Instagram, very, very important. Yeah, yeah. And with hashtags, you can connect to your community. So, but that's a great one for that age range. It's very visual. I don't think it takes as much time as some of them. And with hashtags, it's a great way to connect with niche market. So if you like that one, start there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Like five more minutes. Is there any more questions? Yeah, I know. I have more. Questions? Sorry. <laughs> so we'll do, uh, we'll do one more. Well, at least one more. Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Bueller. <laughs> What's the name of the book you just published? Cool. Okay, so it seems like y'all are good to go with this. What I want to do is I wanted some, uh, well starting with Elaine for a change, final thoughts on niche marketing? Go. <laughs> um, <laughs> the pressure. I am so good. The pressure. <laughs> oh, I guess embrace it because for a long time I blended so many different things that People were like, no, you have to think outside the box. That is my advice because a lot of people are like, no, you have to be in this box no matter what. Think outside the box. Think of ways that you can market. I read an article the other day about someone on Instagram taking a little, I don't know, little rubber doll or something and taking photos of it all around mm -hmm. their city and making a story out of it. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw that article. It was amazing. Yeah. So just think of ways that you could just be different. And there are no rules. So think of ways that you can be out of the box. Find your audience and um, join the community. If there's not already one, then create one. But be active, participate. Fandom is a participatory culture. So mm -hmm. get in there and make it, Hallelujah. make yourself part of it. <laughs> Remember that you are not just selling a book, you are creating a brand. Be ready to focus on the entire, not just the IP of that one line, but who you are and who you are going to be. This will you probably end up in movies, TV, virtual reality games, etc., cetera, et cetera. Be consistent on presenting who you think you are to the world. So I'll reaffirm that and say branding. Get a brand, know your brand, use your brand, and have that brand consistent across platforms and everything you do. I'm going to go um, along with these things. Also, you know, sell the community, support support the community. Don't you know? There there is no reason to be negative. Everybody out there is is you know everyone out there can help you. You don't know who's going to give you the next you know next hand up. I've always told people, make yourself easily found and accessible. Whatever social media you use, make it easy to find and respond to people and interact. Otherwise, if they shout and try to contact you and they hear nothing, they'll move on to the next person. Collaborate. Get to know other authors. Look for ways that you can work together uh, in ways that support all of the participants. Look for mutual benefit whether that's anthologies, whether that's ebook box sets, whether that's cross-promoting events, it's not a zero-sum game. So, and if you want to see more about the ebook box set, come see me after. 
I would say, as an author and editor, lastly, have some fun with it. Mm -hmm. You're in this to be, maybe not all of you, but some of you maybe want to be professional authors for your full-time gig. And I can guarantee you, yeah, a lot of us have those work weeks where they're 60-hour work weeks. And man, See, that's... <laughs> actually, I, actually, yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you guys why later. Um, it's a Tim Ferriss thing, oddly enough. But um, have fun with it, because you're still, you need to love what you do, and if you love creating, you love doing the video games or the role playing or the, or the writing or whatever it is, let, it, let that passion come into everything else that you do. And you will, and you will find that it, you'll, 60 hours is not that much because you're loving what you do. So, real quick, if you could do me the kind favor and give our panelists a loud, raucous <laughs> round of applause. I've been moderating for a very long time, and that was the best I've heard. Now, <laughs> give me the kindness, of course, and give my man Scott and his team Good the job. same Yay! thing. And lastly, it's Sunday, so thank yourselves for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and come up and see us for a minute. Please. Yeah. yeah we have ready. postcards.